isso segue.
these performers, unfortunately, they have to leave immediately. I was very much intrigued by the title of this dance, Soul of Steel, Skin of Water. It's about a European and Russian soul. So thank you so much for this performance. Uh, welcome everybody at this forum on European democracy. Uh, my name is Isha Hexter. I'm your moderator for this afternoon. I'm very happy that I was asked to guide you through this afternoon. Um, today we're going to discuss, I can't see you, it's a bit of a pity. Uh, today we're going to discuss the future of Europe and we're going to, let, to do that through Russian eyes. And I think it's a very important theme because usually we tend to talk about the future of Europe and the future of Russia in Europe solely among Europeans. And we tend to overlook that there is so many people. I've been told seven, over 75% of Russians living on European soil. So I'm really happy that uh, today we have the opportunity to talk to Russians about how they relate to these questions. A very distinguished guest, we have Sergei Polmarov and Alisa Putnikova, they are here. Welcome, thank you so much for coming to the Netherlands. Um, we have two keynotes that, that you will perform in a short while. And in between we have important intermezzos by Vanya Rukavina and Thomas Lukevich. All of their pieces will also relate to this question how is the future of Russia related to the Europe? So thank you so much uh, for showing up today. Uh, I am told that we really have to be ready at five, so that's my main task today, to make sure that we will make that. Um, actually, I would first like to start to ask you, Sergei Ponomarov, to, you, to, to get you to here, to the stage, to hold your uh, keynote speech. You're a very famous photographer. You've won so many prizes. Uh, the most recent one I want to uh, stress out is the, the, the World Press photo for breaking news. And um, I have here the jury report mentioning that it was given to you for photographs that captured the resolve of refugees, the perils of their journey and the struggle of host countries to take them in. So before you start, I would like to ask the question, uh, what is the most important message of your talk? Um, does it work? Yes. Um, well, the important message of my talk is that, um, you'll see it through my presentation, but I think that uh, the migration, the, the story that has been reported for uh, several years now, um, it's, it somehow shifts identities and shapes countries in a different way. And uh, I, as a journalist, um, uh, tend to observe that independently. And from my Russian background, uh, I, th I think that I can judge uh, events that happen in, uh, in, in Europe more independently like rather than European person. And this is, uh, I will present my book project that I'm working on right now about uh, refugees, migration, and how it affects um, European societies. Okay, thank you so much. Hopefully we're going to see a lot of pictures as well, and we'll talk more in depth. <laughs> we will talk more in depth with you and Alisa in a short while. Thank you right. so much. The floor is yours. Thank you. One sec. Um, so, thank you in, for introduction, Kisi, and uh, as she said uh, earlier, I'm, uh, I'm a photographer and I won the WordPress photo, um, actually three times for different stories, and also the Pulitzer Prize and uh, Robert Kappa Gold Medal uh, for different stories, but the most significant story that I have done so far um, was a story about exodus of uh, refugees from the Middle East, uh, from Iraq and Syria. Uh, those that that story that happened in uh, 2015 and 16. I traveled with 
Um, that's that's one of the uh, main pictures in my story, and I traveled with them from uh, shores of Greece till uh, Sweden, and I followed several families, and I uh, followed the news that were uh, evolving on the borders uh, in. Uh, uh, in EU countries and uh, the countries that are surrounding uh, European Union, and before before diving into that story, I'd like you to uh, try to understand the way that I work and what is the modern photojournalism looks like and means. So what I do. Uh, is a visual storytelling and I'm trying to set up uh, a chain of images that all together might tell um, a story. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't have very significant difference from other mediums uh, like documentary films or short, short films or media but for me, for my stories personally, I use only images. And um, I, I have a feeling that uh, when I uh, uh, when I place those images in a chain, and um, uh, this this can tell a greater story than uh, uh, one image by itself. But from the audience side of uh, uh, audience po point of view we might tell that uh, it looks slightly different. It's a uh, visual liter literacy. And for them, it's very important, for you, it's very important to uh, c transfer the visual information that you see in those images uh, into meanings and words and then put all together. Um, of course, of course, it's not not something new. Uh, in the past, we had uh, a lot of uh, examples of uh, uh, telling stories in a visual way. You can see that on those slides. We, you can see the uh, biblical uh, graphic uh, explanation or the modern cartoon film. But uh, in nowadays, photojournalism is in. Uh, field of uh, very high uh, competition and uh, like everyone in this um, in this place probably you have uh, cell phones and you have cameras in your phones and same as I do so what should uh, distinguish me as a photojournalist from uh, other audience and how to distinguish good images from from images that you see daily on uh, social networks and in advertising and everything else. And what I would say is that uh, we somehow, we in, in our photography, uh, we have to resample uh, the uh, art that has been done uh, in the past. And your eye and your brain and uh, will probably distinguish good images from the flow of uh, images as as if you are walking in a on a noisy street and you see music you can distinguish music from the uh, from 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 the regular no no oh, sorry from the regular wo uh, noise of the street but uh, the other thing that the good photography it's only um, uh, it's not only a document it's a metaphor I love this quote from uh, Kazimir Malevich who um, was explaining that you don't need to see a document of his that a photograph of a three chairs it might be not the uh, photograph of three chairs but it might be a metaphor of I don't know for example three people sitting on the chairs and so um, I, I found out that by myself uh, pretty recently that some of uh, photographs that I have been taken in, uh, 
and published were somehow compared with uh, art pieces that were uh, found in the in the galleries and that's that's not my comparison I just want to warn you but I found that in art blogs or uh, in some artistic discussions that's the image that I made on uh, uh, on Lesbos and that uh, won several prizes in photography and a busy street in Damascus and the Syrian fighter sitting next to now destroyed uh, temp uh, no that's uh, arch in Palmyra in Syria oops okay. and the boys swinging uh, next to the destroyed uh, village uh, after the uh, typhoon in the Philippines. So there are many quotes, uh, but they all uh, look the same when people say that good artists copy, great artists steal. And now we go to our main story. It's this is a uh, this is a, th this is a story about uh, refugees and the entire exodus of a huge part of uh, a Middle East population that come to, that has come to uh, Europe and this all started with a small story when I was asked by the New York Times to go to Greece uh, and see that there are, and capture some. Uh, refugee boats that started to come to uh, Greek island and were disturbing um, uh, local tourists and that was something fresh for for Greeks but later that evolved into uh, a huge flow of migration and uh, by the time when I started to work on my story I had to wait sometimes for three or four days for to capture just a single boat that was arriving to uh, islands and by the time when I photographed this picture it was we had like 50 boats um, just bombarding the Lesbos and isle, other island and so uh, my project just uh, is divided in two parts and the first part I decided to depict uh, uh, and tell stories of refugees as a faceless crowd, just a huge mob that uh, once started and decided to come. And then the second part that will go later, uh, I go to more personal stories. And I was inspired by uh, refugees uh, that I was privileged to follow and meet during the journeys. And uh, I was motivated by the de desire to keep telling their uh, stories even uh, even after the our cameras uh, and the headlines uh, ha have switched uh, to other stories, and I walked with those people uh, through fields, rivers, and borders. They look only they took only possessions they could carry on their backs. They walked until their feet were blistered. Uh, and they could not uh, take another trip. Often, when, when they didn't know where to go or uh, even what country they are in, and um, yeah, and and the heart of the book is the, the idea that while migration is about the physical movement of people and the hardship of their journeys, it's also about much more. It's about shifting identities as nations and people shape each other. And it is to borrow the words of Russian-Ukrainian writer and poet Nikolai Gogol in his the, uh, novel The Overcoat. Uh, I was inspired by the little by the, and the great man and how the telling stories of individuals and their sufferings we can expose the great injustices of the system. And some Visually, sometimes uh, this uh, gray overcoat uh, of Gogol was reminding me of those uh, gray uh, UNICEF blankets that refugees were uh, wearing. And of course, the 
uh, unjust system was represented by police that was mostly trained to deal with uh, uh, football hooligans and civil unrest rather than with uh, um, families with kids and uh, uh, disorientated men and winning, wi uh, winning women and I don't know hungry kids who just don't know which uh, which country and which border they are crossing right now. And then. And then for, for the second part of the book, A Long Way Home, I will fo I'm focusing on refugees as they navigate new cultures, languages, lives, and far from their homelands. And for many months I've been w working on this second chapter, traveling to Serbia, Netherlands, Germany, Sweden, and Greece. And I will show you insights into several chapters that have been done. And this one is in ba uh, Belgrade, and I worked in uh, derelict uh, warehouses in, uh, in, what is that? Okay. In, in, the center, in the center of the city where thousands of migra migrants, I double click, uh, thousands of migrants live through winter in horrific conditions due to the closure of the borders. It's like refugee camps on the outside of EU. And in Amsterdam I follow the story of uh, Zina, a Syrian woman who first uh, met whom I first met on Slovenia border where she was uh, traveling with other Syrians and she's now setting up her own uh, catering business and has cooked for events uh, even uh, attended by the royal family. We lost one slide. This is how she looked when we met in Slovenia. And another story from Amsterdam, from the outs outskirts of Amsterdam. I spent days uh, in the former prison of Sloterdijk, something like that. Uh, um, that was converted to uh, the asylum seekers hospital. And for Netherlands, uh, that's that's very unique. Uh, I mean, for me to see such experience in Netherlands uh, was very unique because in other countries I've found it um, less uh, less comfortable uh, conditions for refugees. And in Germany, I made an um, architecture approach and I uh, visited uh, newly built uh, houses that uh, Germany has built for refugees. And this is more like um, architecture, uh, architecture study. Um, And in Germ also in Germany, um, I was at the uh, church. I visited several churches uh, with a congregation that includes something um, 1,600 Afghans and Iranian refugees that who converted to Christianity after arriving to Germany. Um, Some, some are also living on the premises to avoid deportation un under Dublin rules, but uh, also some of them have found uh, a, a new kind of 
cultural and mental, mental shelter in Christianity. Um, that was short, I'm sorry, but uh, that's, that's the story that I've uh, been working on uh, for years, and thank you, Kisi, for introduction. Thank you so much, uh, Sergei. Yes, I have, um, I, well, I have one question. Before you uh, started your lecture, you said you have the feeling that because you're from Russia, you can, from a more independent view, take your... Uh, photos in the European refugee crisis. Um, can you tell us a little bit more uh, about that? How can we see that in the pictures? Um, it's, it's, it, it, I'm not sure that it could be seen in the pictures, but uh, that's, that's the approach. First of all, it's a journalism uh, approach that we are trying not to uh, stick to any sides. So we try to uh, judge independently, and um, from my, I, I'm a Moscovite. I've been born in Moscow, so my background comes from uh, from the Soviet Union. I've been born during that times, and we had an Iron Curtain, and so at some point we were very much segregated from the rest of Europe. And what is happening in Europe, in uh, my opinion, sometimes it's something that. Uh, Russian people need to understand. Um, and what, what, I, what I try to do with my book, I'm trying to see uh, things that are happening as an outsider. Um, I can tell you that I knew just a few photogra European photographers who uh, widely uh, work on the same uh, subject of uh, migration. And uh, the only great photographer that I know who also works uh, on, on refugee-related uh, story is uh, Mohamed Muhaisen. He lives in Netherlands, but he is Palestinian. So probably coming from, from the different uh, area, we um, have a kind of greater view over the all uh, events that are happening in this certain uh, part, of, uh, part of the world rather than seeing just a small uh, peace, like that's my country. That's what's happening there. So you feel you have the feeling maybe that people are other photographers from Europe are too much involved. Uh, no, uh, you you just uh, as as a native you live in uh, in the environment of your local news and probably some things that uh, might be a good topic for my uh, reporting will not uh, strike an interest to uh, local journalists. Okay, thank you so much. We will uh, talk more in depth uh, a little bit later. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sergei. Uh, first, now, as I mentioned before, we've asked Thomas Ludkevich and Vanya Rukavina to, uh, to take us uh, into the theme uh, by some place. The first uh, they're going to perform for us is from Pyotr Chadayev, a first philosophical letter in which he uh, has fierce criticism of Russia lagging behind Western uh, countries. And this is from the 19th century. So I'm really curious to see how they will perform that. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is uh, Vanya Rukavina. I'm a psychologist and therapist. Um, welcome to this live session. Our patient for today is a confused uh, Russian philosopher who's struggling with his national identity.
still discovering truths that are commonplace to people's much less advanced than we. This is because we have never moved in concert with any of the other peoples. We do not belong to any of the ancient families of the human race. We are neither of the West nor of the East, and we share not the traditions of either. We stand, as it were, outside of time. The universal education of man has not touched us. I mean, look around. Everyone seems to have one foot in the air. It seems as though we're all in transit. No one has a fixed sphere of existence. We do not even have homes. There are no habits, no rules that govern anything. Nothing that binds, nothing that awakens sympathy and affection. Nothing that endures, anything that remains. Everything passes, flows away, leaving no trace either outside or within us. We seem to camp in our own houses. We behave like strangers in our families, and in our cities we appear to be nomads, more so than the real nomads who graze their flock in our steppe, for they are more attached to their desert than we are to our towns. Our memories go back no further than yesterday. We are, as it were, strangers to ourselves. We move so oddly in time that as we progress, our immediate past is irretrievably lost to us. And this is but a natural consequence of a culture that is wholly imported and imitative. There is no internal development, no natural progress. In our society, new ideas sweep out the old, because they're not derived from the old, but from God knows where. And since all our ideas are ready-made, the indelible trace left in the mind by a progressive movement of ideas does not shape our intellect. We grow but we do not mature. We move, but in a diagonal line, that is to say, a line that doesn't reach the required goal. We are like children who have not been taught to think for themselves when they grow old. They have nothing they can call their own. Their mind, their knowledge is only on the surface. Their soul is not within them. And this is precisely our condition. Peoples, like individuals, are moral beings. It takes centuries for their education as it takes years for that of a person's. But we may be said to be an exception among peoples. We belong to those nations which do not play an integral part in the human race. We exist only in order to teach some great lesson to the world. Let me just stop you there for a moment, uh, just to give our guests uh, an explanation and some context. It is a truth uh, universally acknowledged that a single man possessed of a good education, Pyotr Yakovlevich Chadayev, initiated modern Russia's search for national identity. You just heard his the first philosophical letter, which appeared in the Moscow Telescope in 18, 20, 1836, after he wrote a letter to gentlewoman Yekaterina Dmitrievna Panova in 1829. Now, Chadayev had written the letter as an introduction to his highly critical thoughts on contemporary philosophy, religion, Russian history and culture, expressed in his eight philosophical letters to a lady. It is equally true that this forefather of Russian cultural studies and ethnic self-consciousness has always struck a sensitive nerve in his compatriots largely because of his paradoxical combination of a thoroughly Eurocentric mind combined with a mystical intuition of Russia's unique destiny among the nations of the world. Chadayev's thought presents Russians with the historic and still pertinent <coughs> enigma of a missionary nationalism that emerges from and is embedded in a Western discourse about the progress of civilization. The publication of Chadayev's comparison between Russia and the West 
caused the intellectual discussion to break out, which continued in the debate between the westernizers and the Slavophiles. Any final thoughts? Yeah. Any final comments? Uh, situated between the West and the East, supporting ourselves with one elbow on China, the other on Germany, we ought to have united within us imagination and reason and have developed a civilization combining the great strengths of true civilizations. But we did not accomplish this. And so I ask you, where are our wise men? Where are our thinkers? Yeah, thank you very much, brother. Thank you. And then I agree? Yes. Please, don't you forget to clap. Yeah. Thank you very much. Times. Um, thank you so much for this uh, thought-provoking uh, intermezzo. Um, we are now coming to the second of our keynote uh, speakers, uh, Alisa Putnikova. Please come over here. Thank you so much. You are uh, the artistic uh, director. I, I have to say this correctly, of the largest regional art project with international participation on the territory of the Russian Federation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so in short, the Euro Industrial Biennale in Yekaterinburg. Right. So you're going to tell us all about that in your lecture, hopefully. Uh, as I heard, you're also working on a new project in Brussels. Can right. you tell us a little bit about yeah, that? Yeah, I will focus, actually, thank you for Chadaev introduction. It will be a lot about... Uh, problems of identity and uh, how we, this contemporary art world, uh, try to work on this issue. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. Can you hear me well? Okay. Just my notes and timer. Yes. Uh, hello again. And uh, I really happy to be here with you and to uh, yeah to be in such a context because my field I'm I'm an institutional person and I'm working with a contemporary art for many years and I'm developing a really interesting institution which is called the National Center for Contemporary Arts and uh, it's a pioneering institution which was established in Moscow in 1992, right after Perestroika. Means we are, let's say, the most responsible um, institution, government-based in Russia for contemporary art. And uh, what is also really interesting about us, I will show you further. And that's why I was happy about Chadaev. <laughs> Because uh, we are talking a lot about identities and uh, uh, actually because we are working in the whole country from Kaliningrad to Vladivostok, it's 9,000 kilometers. We are thinking a lot about maps. And uh, this picture I saw in a Facebook of one my fun friend of mine who was in at Venice Biennale, architectural Venice Biennale a week ago. And uh, for me it's really important story because uh, mm, you can see Russia somewhere there. And uh, the story of light and also the story of how territory enlightened in terms of the global scale. I'm originally from Ekaterinburg. Who knows where Ekaterinburg is? <laughs> Super. <laughs> And when I'm, uh, I started to work with contemporary art in Ekaterinburg, I always felt this lack of understanding from the global art crowd about what does it mean Ural, what does it mean Ekaterinburg, and uh, actually starting to work with this, what does it mean to be local in this global um, world. Uh, we, I also was thinking about this map. This map is map of biennials, uh, biennials all over the world. And uh, mm, it's 
a map which is, I mean, this concentration of uh, biennials. And you see this, uh, it's a strange map, but you can see this uh, point uh, somewhere in Euro-Asia. And uh, it's very important uh, for me that this point appeared in 2010. And, uh, mm, you know, when we started uh, to think what, how we can be integrated in this global discussion, we thought that uh, biennial format would be like fantastic opportunity to to talk about it. At the same time, for us, it was important not just to you know, be placed in this map and contemporary art map, but also to understand, okay, what kind of global, um, what kind of uh, global questions we can raise in this territory, which at the same time would be extremely essential to this, you know, like rooted in this territory. That's why our biennial calls industrial biennial. And uh, it, our practice is about how to, how to work with industry as a heritage and as an actual practice. We are biennial, which is uh, uh, running our exhibitions inside their industrial uh, spaces, abandoned and functioning. We are organizing in residences for artists inside the functioning factories uh, with a variety of uh, types of production, like from porcelain to heavy machine industry. And uh, the, every time we invite an international curator and uh, propose a topic for like the global theme for the whole biennial, trying to reflect uh, uh, really actual questions which we can feel all over the world. And for example, the last um, biennial, which the fourth one happened in 2017. And uh, when in 2015, uh, I've been at uh, St. Petersburg Economic Forum, where was this huge uh, discussion about the future of economic, about the fourth industrial revolution, about how fast the changes is uh, coming to our life and how we should react on it. And, uh, you know, all those uh, people in good uh, jackets and costumes were thinking about, okay, how we will change our money uh, system and how banks will work in, the, in 30 years. But nobody talk about communication, nobody talk about uh, um, society effects, nobody was talking about, I mean, things which uh, artists can feel because they feel this intuition. And that's why the previous uh, Mm, mm, by end of 2017, we decided to devote to this first industrial revolution and discuss the topic of new literacy. Because, I mean, of course, every revolution aims to change the language. And if you change the language, you rule the world. And uh, this new literacy, I was really uh, happy to see uh, the slide from Sergei presentation who started with this literacy because for us it was crucial, and crucial to start th the question of, okay, the literacy in terms of art, what does it mean? And uh, mm, here's uh, some of our locations. Uh, for example, we work on these sites. Of course, when we are here in Amsterdam, we are so close to Ruhr area, and uh, uh, we were inspired a lot by Ruhr, but what we are doing, we are doing maybe opposite approach. Uh, we invite people to their territory, which is deeply rooted in industry, as their like uh, where, where we can see the process of reindustrialization, which is really interested for us. For example, this is a venue for 2015 biennial, and this is a very beautiful constructivist building, and uh, of course uh, dealing with biennial industrial biennial, we are thinking a lot about uh, 30s, 1930s, this social, um, socialistic ideology about all these beautiful ideas in architecture which lead us to this fantastic uh, uh, architectural heritage. And for example, this, uh, mm, this used to be a dormitory for single Czechists. 
uh, KGB officers during the 30s. And uh, in so during Soviet time, it uh, was a hotel, and then it was in the 90s, it uh, had this stupid uh, like reconstruction to normal three stars hotel. And in 2015, it was just abandoned, and we occupied the whole, uh, the whole hotel with artistic works and how it looked like during biennial from the other side. Uh, and uh, this is a question in English, it's who we are, where we are, where we are from, where we are going to. And this is a key work for me from the last biennial. And this is, of course, we are, uh, we are trying to answer through the different uh, through the different uh, artistic uh, voices, and we study, okay, uh, what does it mean to catch this moment in terms of contemporary art, right? And uh, I, I also was thinking, okay, in, in this context of uh, European uh, conversation about uh, identity, what uh, what uh, what would be actual to think um, about this literacy? And for example, our curator uh, Joan Ribas, Ribas, he is from Portugal. He was uh, thinking about uh, this literacy in several direction about how we are changing our visual culture, uh, how we are dealing totally different uh, with our movements, and how we. Uh, how text is still values a lot, um, that we actually not lose uh, our, um, our ability to read and uh, how we still very concentrated in this uh, text culture. And this is uh, the second part, and the second part of uh, my talk. And here I would a little bit more uh, follow my text, because uh, this is another story, which started uh, two years ago, and uh, when we met uh, people from Bozar and at, at Manifesta, and uh, last Manifesta, uh, mm, last Documenta, sorry, so last Documenta, uh, when we were thinking about, okay, so we can see the most depressive Documenta <laughs> in maybe in the in, at Documenta times. And uh, it's really visible that uh, art, like let's say, losing force to uh, to provoke art, losing this uh, mm, this strength to can compare into news, and uh, uh, also art losing its strength in reflecting to this contemporary moment. And so uh, we, um, at the same time, and, and I mean, in many discussions, people were asking why we have this feeling, what's happening, what, what's, what's wrong, <laughs> what's wrong with contemporary art. And, uh, uh, and initiators of this discursive platform, uh, Kathleen Weiss and uh, Luke Tuimans, they were thinking about, okay, maybe, maybe we are uh, really govern art so much that uh, that voice is not so good comprehended as before. And uh, they want to initiate a platform which would give this voice for artists. Again, it's weird because, okay, it's an artist who wants to be curator and the curator who wants to give this freedom for artists, but at the same time, it's a really good um, uh, like attempt. And uh, they, of course, they start, um, they, they read in their statements that um, Europe in dire need for the new artistic and intellectual platform that can offer a space for artistic freedom and transformation as well as for critical reflection on the past, present and future of the continent in the global context. And uh, this global context, we all talking about global context. And uh, what does it mean global context for Russia? What does it mean global context for Europe? Is it the same global context? We uh, start to talk about it. And uh, uh, at the same time, uh, we in our center, we initiated another platform, which really give us their idea and uh, 
uh, and reason to collaborate. And this is a platform which is called Nemaskva in Russia, which is more than Moscow in English. And uh, it's our also story about, okay, we. I, I showed you this map, yeah, where map is really valuable for us. And so uh, it, it's, uh, from one hand, it's about visibility. Do we really see the rest of Russia except Moscow and St. Petersburg sometimes? When you're going to Russia, where are you going? And uh, what does it mean to be visible? And what does it mean global context for all those regional cities? I mean, Nizhny Novgorod, Perm, Ekaterinburg, Tomsk, etc., etc. Uh, and uh, mm, we decide that, uh, okay, maybe artists uh, are those risk takers. Maybe artists are those who mm, can, uh, whom we should ask as well to give us answer and also to, uh, to understand, first of all, we should physically come to their places, to, to those cities, to understand uh, how we can uh, start to work. And uh, our first step, so at the same time, there, is, there are going many, uh, many round tables, discussions in Brussels at the moment, already during one year and a half. And at the same time, we are doing research, we are collecting portfolios, we are doing uh, a lot of analytics about their situation in Russia, but uh, we, our partners are in 28 cities around. And here I'm showing you a route, <laughs> a route of our symposium on tour. Because, you know, we decide that the slow time is maybe the main luxury which we can let ourselves during time now, during our times. And actually what we are going to do, we are going to do symposium on train. And the train leaves Moscow on 12 August already this year. And we have a um, fantastic international group of people who will be traveling for, uh, there will be three groups of people for one week. We are not so cruel to bring people for three weeks um, to Russia. But uh, we propose to really to study our territory physically with us and with discussions and in this dialogue with local artists, curators living in those, in those cities. That's how we start biennial. That's how we start this dialogue about what does it mean, th this identity in this global context, and we chose our own global context. And that's I propose for, hmm, it's time. And that's I propose for, uh, for the for other cities, uh, first of all, metaphorically, which are on our route, but it also we will bring people from other cities as well for our stops to be involved into these discussions. And uh, as my time is over, so my, yeah, I'm actually, I'm done and the last slide is here. Thank you. Thank you so much. For a very interesting uh, lecture, I was wondering if these people are on the train, what, when would you be happy, uh, what would you want them to see, for instance, in uh, Khabarovsk? Is the train going to Khabarovsk Yes, well? the train going to Khabarovsk. So when At least four art groups really interesting are based in Khabarovsk. Uh, yes, say So will. elaborate, what, what, what can the people see in Khabarovsk? In Khabarovsk, so first of all, they will see what does it mean cultural scene in Khabarovsk because it seems empty, but it's not empty. And uh, in Khabarovsk also, in every city we will have, uh, so in, in cities we will have from one to three days stops, and it uh, depends on concentration of activities there. And for example, in Khabarovsk we will spend one day and a half, and we will have people also from Yuzhny Sakhalinsk, from, uh, uh, from uh, also another small city, come to Khabarovsk and also taking part in this symposium. Because all this symposium will be devoted to uh, questions, first of all, of time, of identity, of globalization. And so we will hear, we, they have fantastic university, for example, in Khabarovsk, and people from university will be involved in those discussions. And so also our important mission to organize portfolio review. And for example, now we have 15 
applications from Khabarovsk to take part in this portfolio. And that's actually one of the aims we're going there because otherwise you would never understand that there is something great and interesting in Khabarovsk. <laughs> and also, uh, the, the last mm, story is that uh, af actually this train, it's also like collective curatorial body because all those people, they will choose uh, one unrealized project from artists uh, fr from that train route. And we organize in 2019, end of 2019, exhibition in Brussels, in Bazaar, which will be part of this Renaissance project. And uh, yeah, we give an opportunity for those artists, their work is commissioned, which is, if there is no institution, you would never have this opportunity. <laughs> Thank you. Is it, if anybody wants to get on the train, is it still possible to buy a ticket? It's, it's possible to buy a ticket. <laughs> Good. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, you. It's now time uh, for another intermezzo, uh, a monumental piece in Russian literature, uh, a poem from Pushkin, uh, a piece of the bronze horseman, the statue of Peter the Great, the founder of St. Petersburg. A deserted, wave-swept shore he stood. In his mind, great thoughts grew and gazed afar. The northern river sped on its wide course him before. One humble skiff cut the water silver. On banks of mosses and wet grass, black huts dotted there by chance, the miserable Finns abode. The woods, unknown to the rays of the dull sun by clouds stowed, hummed all around, and he thought so. The Swede from here will be frightened. Here a great city will be wrought to spite our neighborhood's conceited. From here, by nature, we are destined to cut the door to Europe wide, to step with a strong foot by waters. Here, by the new for them seaways, ships of all flags will come to us, and on all seas our great feast opens. An age passed, and the young stronghold the charm and sight of northern nations, from the woods dark and the marshes cold, rose the proud one and precious. Where once the Finnish fisherman, sad stepson of the world alone, by low river banks of sand, cast into waters never known his ancient net. Now, along the full of people banks, cluster the tall and graceful masses of castles and palaces, and sails hasten in throng to the rich quays from all the lands our planet masters. The Neva rivers dressed with rocks, bridges hang over the waters proud. Abundantly her isles are covered with dark green gardens, gorgeous locks. By the new capital, the younger, old Moscow is eclipsed at once. Such is eclipsed the queen dowager by the new queen when her time comes. I love you, Peter's grand creation. I love your view of stern and grace. The Neva waves as regal procession, the grayish granite her bangs dress. The airy, iron-casted fences the gentle, transparent twilight, the moonless gleam of your nights restless when I so easy read and write without a lamp in my room, learn. 
and seen is each huge building stone on my left street and is so bright the Admiralty spires flight and when not letting the night's darkness to reach the golden heaven's height the dawn after the sunset hastens and a half hour is in the night I love your so severe winters as quite still and fresh air and strong frost the sleighs race along the shore's rivers, the girls, each brighter than a rose, the gleam and hum of the ball's dancers, and on the bachelor's free feasts, the hissing of the foaming glasses, the punch's bluish flaming mist. I love your warlike animation of the playing fields of the god Mars, the horse and footmen, priests of wars, so homogeneous attraction in their ranks, in their rhythmic moves, those flags, victories and rendered, the glitter of those helmets, splendid, shot through in military strive. I love, O oh, capital, my fairest, your stronghold guns is thunder and smoke. In moments when the northern empress adds brunches to the regal oak, or Russia lords into a winning stroke against a new and daring foe, or breaking through the light blue ice, the Neva waves, the Neva streams it and exults, scenting the end of cold and snow. City of Peter, just you shine, and stand unshakable as Russia. May make a peace with beauty thine, the conquered nature's casual rushes. And let the Finnish waves forget their ancient bondages and malice, and not disturb with their hate senseless the endless sleep of Peter Grimm. Um, Alisa and Sergei, I would like to invite you to sit over here. And I would also like uh, to ask you people in the audience if you have some pressing questions for Sergei Polomarov or Alisa Pudigova to start thinking about which questions you want to ask because we might have some time uh, for you to contribute to this uh, small Q&A. Um, thank you both so much for your uh, keynote uh, speeches. Very interesting. Um, we uh, asked you to reflect uh, on how in your work the relation between Russia and Europe can be seen. Um, can, you, can you tell us, you already told us a little bit about that, Sergei, how in your work you feel uh, the urge to do that? Um, the urge? Like, um, well, that's that's um, something easy, I think, for, for me, because um, I've been always uh, somehow focused in my, uh, in my works on what's happening in Europe, and then um, I just... But where does that come from? Do you know? Can you remember? When, you, when did you start thinking, I have this focus on Europe? Um, no, it didn't come from anywhere. It's just... Uh, 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 my, my feeling that uh, I'm I'm from from the country that has been uh, disconnected from Europe, but now it's connected, and I'd like to um, experience and study myself what what's going on there. And and how can we can we see that? Because you mentioned before, you have the feeling that it's more independently. Um, is it something that is special in Russia for, for Russians to, to relate to European questions like you do? Well, I think by, by the way of thinking, most of um, Russians uh, uh, are Europeans. But what we have, and you can uh, hear that we have a language barrier that sometimes uh, plays a very big role in um, our mutual relations and by the way we study English and by or, um, uh, and by the way that um, 
um, we we study culture. We have to translate. You have to translate Russian culture to to English, and we have to translate uh, European uh, literature to Russian. So there is this barrier. And, and how is that for you, Alyssa? Because you were raised in Moscow, I think. You were uh, from Yekaterinburg. Um, in your opinion, does it make a difference, actually? Um, I was thinking about my urge to <laughs> Europe, and for example, in uh, for example, with this case of Ural Biennial, we had the curator curators for the first Biennial. It was Ekaterina Djogat, Kosmin Kastinas, and David Reif. And Kosmin Kastinas, he's Dutch. And uh, uh, but actually, Ekaterinburg was established by, by Dutch guys. Uh, we have a long relationship. And uh, mm, for example, for the second biennial, it was Yara Bubnova from Sofia, Bulgaria. For the third, we had Li Jinhua and Biljana Chiric from China. And for the third, for the fourth, it was again Joan Ribas. And I'm, I, I think it's uh, it's just general idea to be uh, in, I mean, to be in this conversation. Um, with Europe, always have this uh, external optics, which comes and uh, and uh, mm, and propose the different view on the territory, on the local scene, it, and etc. And for example, when Kosmin and Katya and David did the first biennial, <laughs> of course we had huge problems with budget, etc., etc. But the curatorial project they proposed. This was the story which put us really on this map because they had brilliant curatorial idea. They, their project was called Shock Workers of the Mobile Images. And those shock workers, it, it was a question in the story of these creative workers, who, who are the real shock workers nowadays. And we were dealing with uh, 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 all that creative class uh, coming and uh, uh, occupying these industrial spaces instead of real workers, and what does it mean? And this is such a common question, uh, both for Europe and for Russia. It's just thinking about the same, um, the same problems, which may be uh, in the different stage here, and for example, appearing in Russia or something which is uh, already more. Um, in urge at Russian territory and just, you know, more, less visible here. And uh, yeah, for me, it's, uh, it, it's just the whole project, it's about this, uh, yeah, it's about this uh, relations and uh, dialogues. And uh, um, the, the main uh, result of Biennial, when we all the time, of course, do in our analytics what's happened after the every edition of Biennial. And uh, it, it, it's, uh, it's, it, it's a question that uh, all our local artists, they doing great career all over the world. I mean, mm -hmm. they yeah, yeah. are it's going clear, everywhere. It's clear that to both of you, it's something natural, eh? more or less. Of course, that's also one of the reasons probably you were invited here. Because I am, I'm thinking about the people you went to school with, for instance. Is these, are these the kind of questions they are relating to as well? I, I just want to uh, follow with Elisa that um, there is a uh, slight gap between Russian people and European people, and sometimes they are more, um, they are sometimes in delayed in some certain uh, um, uh, issues or sometimes advanced. And that, that comes, I don't know, sometimes his, historically that um, Russia was a frontier from uh, and a shield from. Uh, Asian invasions, for example, or um, it was um, uh, sealed with an iron curtain for a while. Um, so it developed uh, its own uh, ecosystem of uh, culture that is now some, somehow is trying to merge with the European, but we, uh, we went further to, I don't know, for example, literature, and Europe went further with uh, visual arts, for example. And for, for example, getting back to school time, right? And for example, half of my classmates, they are based somewhere here in Europe. And uh, half of them, you know, they are stay in Russia and doing, like, connect their life with the country. And uh, I feel that my generation, for example, we were 
uh, of course, uh, as Sergei mentioned, after this uh, opening the Russia to the world, uh, we were eating so fast many things, you know, especially in terms of contemporary art. What does it mean contemporary art in Russia in 90s? It's crazy. I mean, people were, uh, they understood, oh my God, all this world is here and this everything is open. And uh, I mean, Russian actionism, all this political activism, etc. It's all become, ex we have, because it's all so fast, I feel, I think, that it become so wild in, in many sense in 90s, right? Then in 2000s, it's uh, like, yeah, we integrated in this world, uh, the global world, and then it starts uh, to raise another question. Is we still uh, interesting to this global West as something exotic, or we already like, the normal partner and we can be integrated etc and uh, it, it it's still it, it, it I mean it's still a question what uh, who rules the world right because now telling the truth we're not look at Europe anymore like before but uh, it's Asia <laughs> it's what, Asia but what from you the what other did side. it used to be like then Sorry. What, in what way did you used to look at Europe? Uh, because How we, we look at at, uh, at mm, Europe. It means something progressive, right? It means something where there all the like real process. And um, um, for example, Yekaterinburg or, or another local regional center in Russia. Of course, we were. It's uh, all was it, it was all created by all these institutes, Soros Foundation, Ford Foundation, I mean all the Goethe Institute, etc., who established these relations and who m initiated this, uh, yeah, dialogue and uh, the the created the context. We are all talking about context, how you how you feel involved in this global questionnaire, or you are thinking about okay, I'm in Ural, I'm. I'm okay. <laughs> so yeah, how is that for you, Sergei? Because uh, obviously you work in a very international context all over the world, but uh, I, I think you have also friends or maybe relatives who uh, live more most most of their time in Moscow or somewhere in Russia. How is how do they look at Europe? They like to travel to Europe. And um, you, you clearly can define uh, the peop uh, people that uh, had traveled to Europe or never tra traveled to Europe. And unfortunately, you, the majority, majority are those who did not travel, so they did not see any, um, any examples of uh, uh, humanistic society or um, examples of democracy or I don't know um, uh, the, w the way how people live in a differently you know um, so when when you s when you speak to them you you clearly see them by the way they judge uh, things and uh, sometimes on the uh, same thing the European approach and typical Russian approach is very different and this comes with uh, um, sometimes the, the lack of, uh, of uh, travel experience, knowing the world, um, I don't know, things like that. Yeah, because you mentioned I that Europe is being looked at as progressive, but it's not always a compliment in Russia. It's true, and I, I just have another comment to continue, because for example, when we did the first biennial, I was very much stressed, you know, that uh, Katya and Cosmin say demand we should be done as a normal European biennial, no compromises, no. And I was, I mean, of course, when you're doing the first project, uh, you never learn how to do biennial. And uh, for us, it was, uh, so we tried to fit some rules, you know. And my main, uh, mm, I mean, mm, their main, achievement for me after this first biennial was to meet people who are doing biennials and now I'm, an, I'm a board member of the International Biennial Association and I learned that there is no any rule and it's our you know kind of idea of kind of standard what does it mean to do a normal European biennial and we are more interesting for the world when we are doing not a normal <laughs> biennial right but uh, it's when we are doing something 
uh, yeah, something more unique. And uh, this is uh, this is how it works now, right? Because we consider something as a standard of you know, professionalism, management, etc. But at the same time, when we let ourselves <laughs> a little bit, you know, no, uh, yeah, it it become uh, more experimental and more progressive, right, in, in, in good sense of this word. Um, <laughs> people, when they make a renovation in their flat, um, they might... <laughs> they might uh, do that in typical way where you have a lot of uh, um, uh, waste, uh, dust, uh, everything, not everything was done uh, nicely, but if you have a uh, neat and clean and uh, all walls are painted in the same color, for example, I don't know, floors are good, you might call that uh, a European <laughs> renovation. <laughs> renovation. But, but did you feel uh, the urge, uh, Alissa, to add something Russian to your BNL, or did you feel the urge just to make a good BNL? Yeah, it's not about n nationalism, <laughs> right? It's not about uh, something which... It, m let me tell you the story. So Ekaterinburg, it's a city on the border between Europe and Asia, geographically. And when I was in the university, so this idea of uh, looking for identity of this Euro, uh, this borderness, it was the key academic question which uh, at the Department of Cultural Studies and Art History we asked ourselves. And we did a lot of research and a lot of conference about this borderness and uh, who we are, Europeans or Asian, how does it work when you are geographically on such a border, does it mean something or how it, we, mm, yeah, how it feels uh, in terms of this cultural process. And uh, mm, it, it, it's really, but you know, it was such a, uh, it was um, such a strange agenda because, of course, you are you never see anybody Asian in Ekaterinburg, right? So, what does it mean, Asianness? It was the main uh, question because uh, it 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 was only about this stupid uh, uh, monument, which is uh, considered as a border. And one governor once came and said, you know. It's such a popular monument for tourists, and it's uh, located 30, mi 30 minutes away from the city. And you know, let's move the border. For tourists, it would be much easier to get there, to make a photo, you know, put your one leg to Europe, another to a Asia, make happy, etc. And this was my favorite case in all the conference, because this month, let's move this border. And yes, of course, uh, and he moved the monument, and now it's much better for tourists. Tourists can come easily. And uh, that's about about, uh, I guess, all this uh, question of uh, uh, European or Asian. For example, in International Biennial Association, my biennial considered in the continent of Asia. But it's, uh, it, it's nothing to do with Shanghai Biennial or Kwanju Biennial or something else. Of course, we, have, it's, we are more rooted in this European culture, we are more rooted with this European-Russian relations, and uh, still you remember that 2,000 kilometers of Russia, it still belongs to Europe. <laughs> and so con our continent, it's, yeah, it's, uh, it's Russian territory as well. And uh, mm, yeah, it's uh, interesting how we, how we, uh, mm, do we really analyze it as a, you know, as a, kind of problem which we should study, which we should think about and how it influence. And uh, in terms of Ekaterinburg, it's uh, become more speculative uh, talking about this uh, border position. And that's why also in Biennial we switch from this um, narrative, from this borderness to industrial, which is much more vivid and important, I guess. We are on uh, the Forum of European Culture. Um, I think we started this afternoon by saying that we talk a lot about Russia being a part of Europe or separate, apart from Russia, uh, from Europe. Uh, these are very big questions, of course. Do you have uh, a beginning of the answer to these questions? <laughs> part apart. Yeah, because we, we are uh, tending to talk among ourselves, uh, among Europeans, about Russia. And we have now the unique opportunity, since you are here, to ask uh, through Russian eyes, how do you look at the future of your country? 
with respect to Europe? Well, uh, I would not speak from behalf of a country because country is a government and etc. But from speaking from behalf of uh, on behalf of um, uh, people and mm -hmm. yeah, people in my environment, uh, we feel ourselves um, Europeans for, for I don't know ninety percent something. And what about you? I'm thinking about my percentage. Um, <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, about, uh, you know, I'm thinking about my approach when I'm going to Europe, uh, what actually I'm looking for, right? And uh, I think that I always, uh, I always go to Europe to mm, talk with European artists, with uh, European curators, going to the museums. First of all, to uh, mm, to to find uh, maybe first of all this uh, um, incredible heritage, right? From one side, of course, I, I always uh, Euro European cultural heritage like it's crucial for any uh, cultural dialogue. And at the same time, I'm going to Europe to uh, find this common. Uh, common questions to talk about. I, you know, I'm maybe I'm a little bit already crazy with this institutional approach, but for me, with every uh, partner, with every country, with every museum, I think, okay, what do we have in common? Mm, what should we talk about? Uh, how we can continue to work? And uh, I mean, uh, Europe give me a lot of. Uh, a lot of this common ground, a lot of this, let's say, inspiration for common things. And when I was talking about this More Than Moscow project, it's when we met Paul Dujardin, for example, and he told, oh, we are doing this Renaissance project and we are now developing this platform. And it, it appears it's in the moment that, yes, it's something which we would need to, uh, to do together because uh, our uh, interest to Russian regions and their interest to uh, European regions, because the question, what does it mean regions in Europe? Hmm? Uh, it's uh, what does it mean regions in Russia? How we, how we create these horizontal connections? I, I just don't feel... Mm, mm, I, I feel extremely interesting to, um, to talk about it together and uh, not to like to be separated in our certain context. Oh yes, in Russia we have this story, or in Europe you, with your regionalism and certain politics, it's in in, in different way. So for me, it's uh, important uh, m important partner to talk about uh, uh, Russian um, specific and uh, Russian future as well. So mm, yeah. You're still thinking about a percentage, or not? <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I, I have German roots. <laughs> That's why it's too difficult to, <laughs> to define the percentage. Yeah. Um, we have been uh, listening to Chadayev, for instance, uh, so the a debate about the westernizers and the Slavophiles. Uh, this, is this still something that is uh, necessary or that is accurate still in contemporary Russia, this debate? In I what think way? That's, that's an eternal question. Mm -hmm. It goes it goes all the way through uh, Russia. So the part of society is still debating with other parts of society whether we um, should stood in line or go as a crowd. You know. Yeah, and, and it because it n not everybody maybe here is aware on how this eternal debate is taking place inside Russia. Um. Well, there is there is no uh, any place for, for such debate. It's just a uh, way of uh, thinking people and where way they uh, gather all together, uh, uh, and when they meet uh, people thinking in the same way. And I don't know. We we have layers of uh, different uh, um, societies, and we both uh, come from Moscow or from Yekaterinburg, but then uh, Moscow itself is, doesn't really represent Russia. Um, Moscow, Moscow is a uh, country inside a, inside a country, same as New York or London or uh, any big capital in other uh, countries. And um, 
by by some reasons sometimes we don't really um, have connections with uh, uh, people from 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 different uh, parts of the of the country. We are encircled in uh, in in our layers. Mm -hmm. So at at some point we are also disconnected from from the uh, rest of the country by ourselves. And is it in Yekaterinburg it's the same you feel or it's less? You know, so like two answers. So first of all, when sometimes people in Russia travel more often to Europe than inside Russia. That's a very important uh, question also, which is really worrying me and uh, one of the things we want to attract attention within more than Moscow project. It's about when you're in Ekaterinburg, you're not really connected. We are more connected to what's happening in Berlin or in Amsterdam than what's happening in Vladivostok or in Tomsk in the moment. So the country is not really connected. That is really problem, true problem. And so that's why uh, it's about percentage, it's so difficult because, yeah, the percentage is really high because you're grown up, right, with these uh, connections. And uh, we mm, doing this train because you would never travel to these places if you wouldn't uh, make this, like, global trip. So it, you should really need, a re you need to have a reason to travel there because the distance is huge. What is really important, it's those distances and uh, also oh, I lost my ah th that's a question also when you uh, create this horizontal connections but at the same time when culture uh, stays maybe the the last uh, mm, connecting tool because with all these sanctions of course we are not in this pink glasses sitting here and uh, I mean politically it's uh, yeah, it's the situation is very difficult, but at the same time, doing cultural projects, it's a, it's a platform to, to keep dialogue, and uh, you still need visa to go to Russia. And uh, for example, with uh, all these like new situations, so it really takes more time to get visa to Russia. And uh, I mean, I really feel <laughs> this important uh, mission to keep. Um, keep culture connected. We had, we just had this huge forum intermuseum, and uh, the biggest uh, Russian museum director were talking about their um, their difficulties in uh, organizing exhibitions and traveling internationally in all this insurance, which is uh, yeah now more and more. Uh, extraordinary, extraordinary difficult to organize, and everybody keeps thinking that we should <laughs> keep this culture and museum as a free zone of uh, uh, politics. We always mm -hmm. should be above. We sh we can't let uh, politics influence this uh, dialogue and interchange. And uh, this is really important, I guess, when we are talking about okay, what we think about Europe from. Russia. We want to be connected. Thank you so much. Is there somebody in the audience who has a pressing comment? I, 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 I have to be very strict because we only have time for two. So I see two. So I will come to you. Uh, yeah, thanks first of all very much. It was really inspiring to listen to both of your talks and the discussion. Um, I wondered, um, uh, I've been wondering this afternoon, I always wonder at how um, for instance, you, Sergei, when you say that your friends traveled to Europe, or when, uh, Alisa, you say that Katja Jogart wanted to have a European exhibition, okay, Yekaterin Book is a bit of a difficult case because of the border, or when you talk about the relationship between Russia and Europe, why we do that? Because your friends don't travel to Europe, but they live in Europe, um, and the exhibition, maybe... Once again, Yekaterin is a bit more complex, but you could argue that the exhibition is a European exhibition. So I wondered, wouldn't it be better if we are a little bit more precise in our language and if we talk about traveling to Western Europe or uh, Katja Djogert wanting to have an exhibition uh, which is similar to exhibitions in other parts of Europe. So just that very small linguistic change, I think, can help a lot to to think about Russia, to sort of conceptualize it. Because I keep on noticing this in the Netherlands too, that very often we have debates about Russia as if 
it's this completely isolate identity, whereas strictly geographically, it's, it's part of Europe. So do you agree that if you would add that small adjective, wouldn't that already help? If you would just talk about Western Europe in these cases, rather than Europe? I have uh, an answer which maybe make this problem more complicated <laughs> because it's <That's laughs> always nice uh, because we also have the word west and, uh, um, and, and 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 you know and and what does it mean with west all the parts of okay well by by the term by the meaning of uh, travel to Europe we also uh, mean that we have to uh, apply for a visa and uh, Schengen visa and so uh, that's the uh, the borderline between it is yeah so but then uh, you are free to travel anywhere and you might go to Berlin or you might go to uh, Amsterdam but uh, but then th this process uh, starts with uh, obtaining a visa and probably this is why we refer to travel to Europe means start applying for, for a document. <laughs> yeah, one more question here. Sorry. I will hold it for you. Uh, yeah, Sergei, I had a question about uh, your work. Obviously, the way the migration crisis is looked upon in Europe and Russia is very differently. Uh, in Europe, you know, parts of society have really embraced the migration crisis and a uh, lot of hot topic of debate in Russia. Mostly, the especially the state media has, has been very critical of of it. Uh, for Europe, you know, portraying, framing it as at the end of Europe, uh, you know, making up a, a lots of stories about uh, you know rape stories, horrible sort of all the negative. Every single negative aspect is being uh, uh, sort of really emphasized upon. Even amongst sort of even when you talk to I feel to more educated parts of society, they still look upon you know with skepticism. You know, you know very. Uh, as if you know this migration crisis is really the, really the end of Europe. Uh, do you hope with your work, especially with your part two, uh, which really looks upon the personal stories, do you hope to change a bit of the perception in, in Russia itself? Is that as at all something you're thinking about? Um, I hope so, but I'm not. I'm not really sure because we have to start explaining uh, from from uh, from very far in the past, like what had uh, happened with uh, Turkish migrants in Germany in the 60s and what had ha happened with the Surinamese Im migrants in Netherlands and that uh, Europe has its own uh, experience in hosting uh, um, thousands of uh, refugees before, so it's not a big problem for them now, for example, but uh, my main audience are Europeans uh, and I also uh, wish that probably I could make a copy of this book translated to Arabic language so it will target also uh, Syrians, uh, Arab speakers in, in Europe. Unfortunately, I'm not aiming uh, to I'm not aiming uh, Russian audience uh, for this book. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to ask you one more question um, for in, uh, in about 10 minutes time, so you have time to think about it, in what way you are going to continue in your work uh, the relationship towards Europe. And uh, while you think about that, uh, I am very happy and proud that I can announce to you a very special distinguished guest who came a long, long way um, and who's going to uh, perform for you here live. It's really very special and it's uh, Mr. Dostoevsky himself. For some months now, my friends, you have been urging me to hurry up and describe to you my impressions from abroad, never suspecting that your request simply has me at my wit's end. What shall I write for you? What can I say that is new, as yet unknown, that has not been said before? Who among all of us Russians does not know Europe twice as well as he knows Russia? I put twice here out of courtesy, but ten times is more accurate. I was in Berlin, 
Dresden, Wiesbaden, Baden-Baden, Cologne, Paris, London, Luzern, Geneva, Genoa, Florence, Milan, Vienna, twice in some places. And I traveled to all these places, all of them, in exactly two and a half months. Now tell me, is it really possible to examine anything properly when such a long journey has been made in two and a half months? Now you will recall that I drew up my itinerary beforehand while still in Petersburg. I had never been abroad. I had longed to go almost since my earliest childhood. Finally, at the age of 40, I broke loose and left Russia. Needless to say, I wanted to see not only as much as possible, but everything, absolutely everything, despite the limited time. Even if I don't study anything in detail, I thought, I'll still have seen everything and been everywhere. I'll still form a whole picture from everything I see, a kind of overall panorama. And now what is it that saddens me the most as I sit at home and recall my summer wanderings? Not the fact that I didn't uh, examine anything in detail, but that I went almost everywhere, you see, yet not to Rome, for example. And had I been in Rome, I still might have missed the Pope. In short, I was overcome with an unquenchable thirst for something new, for a change of place, for overall synthesized panoramic impressions from a broad perspective. So what do you expect of me after such confessions? What shall I tell you? What shall I depict? A panorama, a, a vista? But the first thing you will say to me is that I've flown too high. Besides, I consider myself a conscientious man and I would not lie by any means, not even as a traveler. Yet if I, begi yet if I begin to depict and describe even a single panorama, I am bound to lie. And not because I'm a traveler, but simply because in my circumstances, it, it is impossible not to lie. Judge for yourselves. Berlin, for example, produced in me the most bitter impression. And I spent all of one day there. I, I know now that I'm guilty before Berlin and that, that I would not dare to positively assert that it produces a bitter impression. On the other hand, um, the Berliners themselves, to a man, looked so, they looked so, so German that I quickly slipped away to Dresden, harboring in my soul a most profound conviction that getting used to Germans required a special effort and that if one is not used to them, they're extremely difficult to bear in large masses. <laughs> well, in Dresden, my uh, offensiveness extended even to German women. Uh, as soon as I had gone out into the street, I imagined there was nothing more repulsive than the Dresden type of women. women. And that even the singer of love himself, Vsevolod Krestovsky, the most assured and cheerful of the Russian poets, would be completely at a loss here, would perhaps even doubt his cause. Within two hours, everything became clear to me. Uh, having returned to my hotel and stuck out my tongue before the mirror, I was convinced that my judgment on the ladies of Dresden was the blackest calumny. I, a sick man, suffering from a liver ailment, my tongue was yellow and malignant. Can it be, I thought to myself, can it really be that man, this Tsar of nature, is dependent to such a degree on his very own liver, I thought. How base. With these comforting thoughts, I set out for Cologne. I admit I was expecting a great deal from the cathedral. I used to sketch it with reverence in my youth when I was studying architecture. Uh, a month later, when I, was, when I was passing through Cologne on my return trip from Paris and saw the cathedral for a second time, I felt like begging its forgiveness on my knees for not perceiving its beauty the first time. But, nonetheless, I did not like the cathedral at all the first time. It seemed to me uh, like lace, lace, nothing but lace. A haberdasher's knick-knack resembling a paperweight for a writing desk about 150 meters high. Not very majestic, I decided. Just as in the old days when our grandparents decided in regard to Pushkin, writing comes too easily for him, nothing very lofty there. I suspect uh, there were two circumstances which had an influence on this first decision of mine. The first being eau de cologne. No matter what hotel you were staying in or what your mood might be, no matter how much you try to hide from your enemies, they are sure to find you and shout, eau de cologne ou la vie. There's no way out. 
The second circumstance which uh, infuriated me and made me uh, unfair was the new Cologne Bridge. Well, the bridge, of course, is magnificent and uh, the city has a right to be proud of it, but I felt it was too proud. Needless to say, I immediately became angry about this. Besides, the penny collector at the entrance to the Wondrous Bridge had absolutely no right to take from me that reasonable toll, looking at me as if you were collecting a fine for some unknown offense I had committed. I do not know, but it seemed to me that this German was throwing his weight around. He probably guessed that I'm a foreigner and a Russian at that, I thought. His eyes at least were all but declaring, you see our bridge, miserable Russian? <laughs> well, you are a worm before our bridge and before every German because you do not have such a bridge. You will agree that this is offensive. The German, of course, never said any such thing, and perhaps it never entered his mind, but that doesn't matter. At the time, I was so certain that this was precisely what he meant to say, that I finally flew into a rage. The devil take you! I thought. I immediately uh, skipped away to Paris, hoping that the French would be much nicer and more entertaining. Now, judge for yourselves. If I had controlled myself, if I had stayed in Berlin not a day, but a week, uh, let's say uh, four days in Dresden, three days in Cologne, or even, even just two, I probably would have taken a second or a third look at the objects through different eyes and would have had a more proper notion of them. Even a sunbeam, a simple sunbeam would, would have meant a great deal here. Had a sunbeam shone on the cathedral as one did on my second arrival in Cologne, the edifice would surely have appeared to me in its true light. And not as it did on that cloudy and somewhat rainy morning, which was capable of, of arousing in me only an outburst of wounded patriotism. And so you see, my friends, two and a half months are not enough to truly examine everything. And I'm unable to provide you with the most accurate information. At times, I must unwillingly tell a falsehood. And that is why... But here you stop me. You say that in this instance, you do not need accurate information. That if needed, you will find it in the Lonely Planet. And that on the contrary, it would not be bad at all if every traveler sought not so much absolute accuracy, which is almost o always beyond his powers to obtain, as absolute sincerity. He would not be afraid to sometimes reveal some personal impression or adventure of his, even though it might not bring him a great reputation. In short, you require only my personal but sincere observations. Think about that. Thank you very much. Dostoevsky, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> it was really great. Yeah, um, yeah, you can come here, but it will be very short. Uh, did you have some time to think about the question how you're going to relate your future work to Europe? Uh, I have this. Yeah, you have this. Um, well, yeah, I, I want to continue with uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky, who said uh, also that humanity knows much more about itself than is uh, recorded in literature. And so um, that's, that's what, what I have to do. I just need to follow the humanity and uh, record that with my medium that I'm used to work with. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. What about you? Uh, brilliant uh, relations to Dostoevsky. Well, I also want to sit on this train. And uh, yeah, I just think I will stay in my train. <laughs> okay. With all the Europeans joining us to make the picture much broader than it than it's exist for the moment. Thank you so much, uh, two of you, for coming to here, to taking um, us 
inside your brains a little bit, explain about your work, about your thoughts, your relationship towards Europe. Very, very interesting, thought-provoking as well. Um, we've almost come to a closure. I also want to thank uh, the dancers, Oksana Shevchuk, uh, Rosanne Bakker, and of course, a big applause for uh, Mr. Dostoevsky, also known as Vanya Rukavina and Tomas Dudkevich. Thank you for coming. Um, we are going to listen to uh, one more poem uh, from Mr. Pushkin and uh, after that I would like to invite you all to come to the bar and talk to you if you have time to stay a little bit and thank you so much for your patience and your interesting questions. Pushkin. a small poem from Pushkin, Exegi Monumentum, and we're gonna do this in the dark. I've reared a monument not built by human hands. The public path to it cannot be overgrown. With insubmissive head, far loftier it stands than Alexander's columned stone. No, I shall not all die. My soul in hallowed birth of art shall brave decay and from my dust take wing. And I shall be renowned whilst on this mortal earth even one poet lives to sing. Tidings of me shall spread through all the realm of rust. And every tribe in her shall name me as they speak, the haughty western pole, the east's untamed tungus, north fins, and the south steppes kalmyk. And long shall I, a man dear to the people, be, for how my lyre once quickened kindly sentiment, I in a tyrant age who sang of liberty and mercy toward fallen men. To God and his commands pay thou good heed, O muse. To praise and slander both be nonchalant and cool. Demand no laureate's wreath, think nothing of abuse. And never argue with a fool. <laughs>